Our first keynote is going to be Adam Schostak. Now this is, I'm not going to introduce him because he can do a better job than I ever can of introducing who he is and what he is. But every one of you in your bag should have a copy of his latest book. As someone who's had the opportunity to work with Adam for many, many years, in the days when threat modeling wasn't actually talked about, I've learned quite a bit from him over these years, and I'm looking forward to seeing what he goes and presents for you today. So without any further ado, Adam. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and opening the first physical AppSec p and And since this is our first physical AppSec p and I was talking to Dana, and I thought, I should have a P&W theme and it should start with something physical. And so this is from Tacoma Narrows to West Seattle, lessons from a century of Pacific Northwest and British failures. <laughs> and so we start out with Tacoma Narrows. Um, famously, Galloping Gertie collapsed in 1940. And for those of you in Seattle, you know that the West Seattle Bridge was closed for two years because it was cracking. And they reinforced it and rebuilt it. And the Washington Department of Transportation has done a great job of explaining all the stuff that they did. And so if you are a bridge engineering geek, this, what they have done with carbon fiber reinforcements is really cool. If not, um, oh, that's okay, too. Um, but let me, let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I do a lot of work in threat modeling, maybe what I'm best known for. Early in my career, I helped to create the CBA. I'm on the review board for Black Hat. I'm an affiliate professor at the University of Washington, where I teach security engineering. And I run a consulting firm called Showstack and Associates. We help people develop great threat modeling programs. And I'm only here representing Showstack and Associates, by the way. And what I want to talk about today, I'm going to start with bridges. I'm going to talk about incidents and the investigations and liability that happens. And I'm going to end with software. These ideas interleave through the talk a little bit, but this is the general outline. And so as we talk about bridges, if you have not read Henry Petrosky's Engineers of Dreams, it's a great book. Who here has read Henry Petrosky? Anyone? Wow, you should all go read Petrosky. He is fantastic as a thinker about how engineering works. He is a phenomenal writer. I really like his books. And if you want to read one book that talks about bridges, this is the one to go with. So we're going to talk about the laws of physics a little bit. I'm going to talk about the material costs, what happens when bridges fall down. And so this, this aqueduct in the south of France was built by the Romans. It was built 2,000 years ago, and it's still standing. And that's because it turns out that putting stone in compression works really well and isn't that complicated as a matter of engineering. Similarly, there's road suspension bridges, some quite long, all over the world. And so we've had long bridges for quite a while. And in 1779, the English decided to build a bridge out of iron. Because iron, despite being really expensive, the amount of iron they needed to build the bridge was way cheaper than the amount of stone they would have needed build the same grid, and so they started building out of iron. And by 50, 75 years later, this was a common thing. And each of these changes in the way they built the bridges involved experimentation, it involved learning, and I think of those transformations, when I read about those transformations, I see echoes in what we do. That as we transform the way we build software from very waterfall to very agile, as we move the way in which we deploy from in our data center to somebody else's data center, cloud center, operating systems, I see similarities in the engineering transformations that some of the early participants, the early adopters, suffer, and some of the early adopters really win. 
And so I think there's a lot we can learn from what happens in the way that bridges work. And when we think about bridges, material costs dominate a bridge. Bridges are very large, heavy objects. So for example, this is the George Washington Bridge. And I just want you to pause for a second and think about how much raw physical stuff is in that bridge, never mind the arrangement. But just look at the piles of steel. And by the way, the George Washington, built in 1931, was the longest main, sprint, main span bridge for six years. It was surpassed by Golden Gate. And it was 103,000 tons of steel. It's uh, 25,000 tons of wire, enough to wrap around the equator four times. 20,000 tons of masonry. And this costs $60 million um, to build, about $1.2 billion in today's money. And this table shows some of the bridges built in the 1930s. Um, and so you'll notice they're all compatible in terms of their center span length. And then the, the depth of the girder and the wind truss is there. And then the next two lines are ratios of depth to length and width to length. And you'll notice that those are quite disparate, right? The, the George Washington with a depth to length of 120 versus Tacoma Narrows with a depth to length of 350. And you'll also notice that the cost is tenfold different, right? But one of the reasons that the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was built as light as it was was the cost of materials. And the lack of material to stiffen and hold the bridge in place caused it to gallop. And these cost factors, I think, are ones that we can all sympathize with. We're all being asked to do more with less, to deliver more, faster, lower cost. And in the world of bridges, that led, that led to the famous collapse of the Tacoma Narrows. And when bridges fail, it's sort of obvious. On, on the left, you see the first Tay Bridge, and on the right, you see the second one. And this is a modern picture because pulling out all of the concrete uh, bearings is just too expensive. And so when a bridge collapses and there's a pile of this expensive material in the water or in the canyon, um, there's liability. People get angry that their expensive materials are now waste. And that liability includes civil liability. You get sued. And if there are people on the bridge and they're hurt or killed, um, then there's civil liability. Engineers can go to jail for the decisions that they've made. There's also sort of informal results. No one wants to be explaining to their boss or the public, oh yeah, that Tacoma Narrows group, they really learned their lesson after the first one. <laughs> Um, and so there's reputational issues, and, our, and the professional judgment of engineers is informed by all of these investigations, and the choices which they make are informed by the consequences of failure. And I think that has a lot to teach us as well. And so this, this is the new Tacoma Narrows Bridge, actually the two new Tacoma Narrows Bridges. The one on the left made out of concrete is a few years older. They built a second, a second bridge next to it. And if you look at it, they're far enough apart that they don't hit each other in the wind. It's, and I drive over the Tacoma Narrows on a regular basis, and I never worry that it's going to fall down because we've learned some useful lessons because there are investigations. And so these investigations, first thing to understand is they're external. They're outside the control of the people who built the bridge. They often seek to assign blame in various forms rather than just figure out what happened. They try and place blame and say, this decision, I'm going to pick on Dana, this decision that Dana made was an unreasonable one. Um, and they're adversarial. And so, this chart over on the right is from Nancy Levison's Engineer in a Safer World. And in the box which I've added, there's what happens in the company. And then above the company, things flow up. 
accidents and incidents, operations report, whistleblowers, and those flow to regulators, they flow to insurance companies, they flow to courts, and what comes back, regulations, standards, case law, informs what happens in the future in very important ways. And so, so when I compare bridges to software, bridges are really dominated by the laws of physics. The cost of building a bridge is dominated by materials. There's investigations and there's liability. And in software, um, what we do is dominated by teaching Sand new tricks. This year's popular trick is teaching Sand to have conversations and things like ChatGPT. There's always something new going on that um, sometimes really amazes us. And the cost of thinking is really the thing that dominates. The cost is people working to create these things um, rather than the materials that go into it. And in software, last year, the US government stood up a cyber safety review board. And this year, in the national strategy, there's discussion of liability. And I think these things are going to have tremendous impact on the way we work in software. And that's going to have tremendous impact on the way that we, as asset professionals, get our jobs done. And so in software, when software falls down, um, there's a retrospective, which is run by PR um, and legal, or at least filtered through them. And so this, this is from March, Reddit fell down, and um, you'll know that they've got like a six paragraph executive summary, and then the whole retro takes like 30 minutes to read. And at the end of it, it says, if you're this type of person who likes reading these things, you should come work for us, which is how we know it's filtered through PR. Um, and there's a lot of great lessons in it, actually. It's worth reading. It's interesting. And I think there's an interesting comparison between operational retrospectives, which are big and contain a lot of these details, and security retrospectives, which tend to contain a lot fewer details, and we're all totally used to that, right? But if we stop and think about it, it's weird. What happened at Reddit was entirely their fault. What happens when there's a break-in is not our fault. We're more willing to talk about the things that are our fault than the things that are not our fault, which I think is backwards. I mean, I'm glad that we have the operational retros, don't get me wrong but why don't we talk more about the security things? Um, anyway, in, 2000, in 2022, um, the executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity had five segments, one of which was the creation of a cyber safety review board. And this came after 30 years of people talking about the concept um, those that people talking about the concept culminated in a National Science Foundation workshop, which I helped run. Some of the work that I've done is listed in the showstack.org resources page. And the workshop, which I'll talk about, resulted in this report, Learn from Cyber Incidents, Adapting Aviation Safety Models to Cybersecurity. And this is work that I did with Rob Kanaki and Tara Wheeler. And what we did was we brought about 60 people together. We had a virtual workshop via Zoom and Slack over the course of about eight weeks. We got to hear from a former chair of the actual Na National Transportation Safety Board. So about three times fast. We got to hear from a gent who was on both the Columbia and Challenger Accident Investigation Boards. We got to hear from insurers, from lawyers, from um, forensic responders. It was a really interesting workshop. And what we did was we captured all of the pros and cons associated with a review board of this type. And um, 
as we were working on it and as people were drafting the executive order, we shared copies of the draft report with them and it helped them gain comfort that this board was a good thing. So the board has now stood up, it's operational, it's released its first report. They're releasing more in the near future. And I think this is going to be a fairly transformational thing. If you have not looked at the log for j after action report, it's worth looking at and thinking about. I expect their other ones will be worthwhile as well. And so let's talk about liability for a minute. And as I think about liability, my intuition is that politicians across the spectrum here in the United States are demonizing big technology companies. And there's massive profits at these big technology companies. And so I think that politicians are going to alter the deal um, and we're going to see an imposition of liability on software companies over the next few years. So a little bit of history. Um, in the 1960s and the 1970s, people realized that this software thing might be important to the economy. It might be helpful to have computers doing things for us. And in the 1960s and 70s, we knew that we didn't have to make software that wasn't buggy. And they said, gosh, if you could get sued every time your software is buggy, this industry will never take off. And so there was a carve out that allowed you to write um, software licenses to say no warranty express or implied. And that certainly helped the industry grow. Um, and then over the next 50 years, we, that, that became a norm, a standard. And then in the 2010s, the Federal Trade Commission started saying, you know, if y'all are writing words like, we take your security seriously, and you don't spend a dollar on security, that might be deceptive or even unfair. And unfair and deceptive trade practice is the thing that the FTC was stood up to address. And so they've built a body of case law that says, if you do not have security in your system, we can find you. And so they have a program called Start With Security, which lists off some things which we might think are relatively basic, but all of that is written in the experience of this company didn't bother. And some of the companies in question are a bit well-known names and they just didn't bother with these things. Um, in 2016, the Attorney General of California, Kamala Harris, who's gone on to bigger and better things, um, said not implementing the CIS top 20 constitutes a lack of reasonable security. And so we're seeing a shift in the underlying pressures on the way software is built. And today in the US National Cybersecurity Strategy, um, which my colleague Rob Kanaki is now the uh, Deputy Director for Strategy and Budget at the Office of the National Cyber Director. And so we've been talking about this sort of thing for a little bit. And it says software makers are able to leverage their market position to fully disclaim liability by contract, further reducing their incentive to follow secure by design principles or perform pre-release testing. And so you see, Right here, the AppSec work that we do, being tied to liability, being tied into the National Cybersecurity Strategy of the United States. So when I say this is going to influence the way our jobs are being done, I'm not being aspirational, I'm noting available facts and putting them in order for us all. So the National Strategy came out in February or March or so, and in April, CSER released a document entitled Shifting the Balance, Principles for Security by Design. And this isn't just from CISA. It has logos from NSA and FBI, and also um, security agencies from Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, and the Netherlands. So these shifts are not US-centered. They, they may be US-centered, but they're not US-only shifts. And I think they are tremendously important. 
More sectorally, the Food and Drug Administration has issued a notice that as of October, they are going to refuse to accept new medical devices that don't take security into account um, at the design phase, what they call the pre-market phase, um, before you ship. And that's a big shift that has a lot of medical device makers sitting up and taking notice. And then there are state laws, and there's a profusion of these state laws. I just want to call attention to the Washington My Health, My Data Act. Um, Mike Hinsey, who has his own law firm, or the Hinseys have their own law firm, has been blogging about this, says that it is tremendously broad, tremendously impactful, because the things that are counted as health data are broader than you expect. And so it impacts anyone doing business in Washington in some interesting ways. And so we're seeing this formation of liability for what we do in software. And so generally, regulation is accompanied by prescriptive guidance. Right, you follow the rules and you'll be okay. And I just want to be very clear, I'm not a lawyer. I'm also not your lawyer. Um, and so some examples of this. In the building codes, it says, if you're gonna put this many amps through a wire, it has to be this gauge. You have to put sockets every six feet. And there are rules if you want to drive a car on a public road. There are rules that apply sometimes. And there's a test you have to take. Um, and all of this, is backstopped by the idea of recklessness. If you drive recklessly, even, even if you weren't violating a specific other rule, if the circumstances meant you should have been driving more carefully, you can be cited for reckless driving. The, the formation of judgment supplants, not supplants, complements these formal rules. And I think that that professional judgment is something which in our field is changing incredibly rapidly. What is expected? What are norms? At the speaker dinner last night, we had a fascinating conversation about how different organizations deal with something like OWASP ASVS. Some take it as a starting point, some take it as a checklist and we're now complete. And our judgment is going to be called on more and more what is reasonable given the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And so, you know, people would like to know um, what, we, what they should do to be safe, and specifics are good, right? Right? Um, and, and when we get into these specifics, I've been talking to a lot of people about these ideas. The first thing in, I hear is often liability will backfire. We'll just see more and more events being hidden, and maybe that's true, but we have, we, we have things to deal with now, like whistleblowers and criminal penalties for not doing what they're supposed to do. And when we get into these specifics, it's really hard to hit 100%, right? If, if you're doing, dealing with CS, NIST CSF or D, the New York Department of Financial Services, even PCI, it can be hard to be compliant. And when we get to AppSec, we have relatively few clear bars, right? The, the bars for operational security are much more specific, they're much more clear. And so when I think about what might, what might liability look like, um, I like to play with I like to play with situations, both real and hypothetical. And you know, as as I was writing this last week, it turned out that Gigabyte, a uh, manufacturer of motherboards and computer components, downloads some stuff, quote unquote, insecurely, and then runs it at startup. Should Gigabyte have to replace those motherboards for anybody? Um, I'm not really sure. We, yesterday, yesterday, two days ago, Barracuda said, yo, turn off your enterprise security gateways. They're unfixable. Are they liable? Turns out their contract is on the web. You can find it. Section 10 says 
no warranties express or implied. We're only liable for the money you've paid us in the last 12 months. Reasonable, acceptable. I think it's useful to think about cases like this, and I also think it's useful to think about cases in design. Right, so for example, if someone is selling a device in 2010, just going back in history a little bit, but if someone is selling a device in 2010 and it runs on Windows XP, is that okay? XP was two revs out of date at that point, right? Vista and Windows 7 had shipped. Um, what if you're designing new here in 2010? Should you be liable for that? Should you be, should we judge that? How should we judge that? And I think these questions are super important as the world in which we live in is shifting. I do want to mention open source because a lot of people say, oh my god, liability will kill open source. And nobody wants to do that. Um, so everyone understands open source is an economic good in the United States as a result of a bunch of cases in the cryptographic world, cryptography world. Um, it's understood that um, source code is speech, which makes it very hard to limit or assign liability for. And the US national strategy actually mentions open source. Specifically, it says responsibility must not be placed on the open source developer of component. And there's an analogy here to car makers who buy a lot of their components from other people. And the liability accrues to the final goods assembler, someone like Ford or GM, not the people who build the steering wheel assembly or the side mirror assembly whose names we don't even know. Um, now, I will mention the EU has a Cyber Resilience Act. It's more worrisome. Uh, Bert Huber has been blogging about that. He's got a couple of really good long leads on it, which I'm not going to go into. But I did want to mention that um, there are important differences in what's happening over in Europe. So I think what we're going to see over the next couple of years is that we will see liability imposed more on software makers, and there'll be what's called a safe harbor. Right? If you do these things, you'll be safe. So if you write your code in a memory safe language, you can be in the safe harbor. If you threat model, you can be in the safe harbor. If you ship with known exploitable vulnerabilities, then you can't be. These are examples. These are not what will necessarily happen, but I think they might be reasonable ways of thinking, and there'll be and there'll be a safe harbor for open source. I expect we'll see a workshop where we'll assemble up the knowledge. People will be talking about liability for software manufacturers for at least 20 years. There's a lot of stuff that's been written, scattered around, out there and available. And one part of this is going to be the definition of the role of professional judgment. And so this matters a lot to everyone in the room. What is a reasonable choice for you? What are the times and places in which business pressure to ship causes you to make a decision that you're very uncomfortable with? How could that or should that play into the forthcoming liability rules? This is, this is a, to me, one of the more important questions in our field today. And so I think that investigations and liability are a huge shift. I think they are a shift on the order of cloud or agile development, that they are going to be massive shifts in the way our day-to-day our -day jobs happen. The United States and the European Union are proceeding quite differently. And, and I want to mention that this is not all rainbows and unicorns. Um, these things may have a slowing effect on innovation. They may have a slowing effect on how we do our jobs, right? If there was liability for unusual practices, we might have prevented the adoption of Agile. We might have prevented the adoption of Cloud because there were certain way. People saying, that's crazy. You can't ship software without a product requirements definition doc. 
how can you possibly put your computer in someone else's data center? You have no way to know what's going on, right? And so I, I do want to be clear that these are not um, necessarily, these are not uniformly, I believe these will be positive if we get them right. And so when I think about the, this, these are AppSec engineering transformations. And through my career, I've had the chance to see a lot of these. So early in my career, in 1996, I wrote a set of source code review guidelines. I was working for Fidelity at the time. Fidelity has now given me permission to say that I was releasing their document um, for comment and feedback back in 1996, but they were very private about it for a long time. And so that was sort of my, the early part of my career. In 2002, um, Bill Gates released the Trustworthy Computing Memo, in which he said Microsoft is going to code, is going to deliver trustworthy products. And I realized that there may be people in this room who were not born when that uh, <laughs> memo came out. And so let me <coughs> emphasize just how important Microsoft was at the time, right? Microsoft was Google, Facebook, Amazon, all rolled into one. They were the one big influential player. And people hated their lack of security, passionately, violently. Um, I remember when the, the head of the MSRC called phone researchers terrorists. Um, no, I'm, I'm dead serious. Um, there was there was bad blood between Microsoft and the security community of the time, and this was a huge transformation. Um, and I've written about some of this in my 25 years in AppSec, looking back, looking forward. Um, but when I think about the, the 25 years, I think about um, SDL, or Secure Software Development Frameworks, as NIST like to call it, and pay no attention to that becoming mainstream, I think about platform improvements, better languages with memory safety, smarter runtimes that randomize things, tooling, um, you know, stack analysis, fuzzers, all sorts of nice stuff. Um, and I think about skills for the few being augmented by broadly held skills. And I've been thinking a lot about how we achieve this and think about it as similar to the pipeline problem. And so I want to mention that this thinking underlies the, the new book, which you all have copies of, thanks to the sponsor. And just to speak briefly about this, um, the first six chapters are built around stride. You may notice, I've, if you're paying close attention, that I've swapped elevation of privilege for expansion of authority, because I think it's easier to think about and to understand. And then there's a chapter on predictability, there's one on parsing, there's one on kill chains, and for you, you're gonna find the first five chapters or so to be stuff that you as AppSec professionals are familiar with. There's more new thinking towards the end of the book just as it worked out. But when I think about why I wrote this book and what I am hoping to achieve with it, I believe, oh, and by the way, the title, Threats, What Every Engineer Should Learn From Star Wars, is really the intent. There are aspects of security that every engineer should know. Um, this is gonna be another massive shift. Asking every engineer in your organization to know something about security is a big, complicated goal. It's a difficult thing to reach. And I like threats as a way of thinking about this because threats motivate our answers to what can go wrong and that motivates the design of new features and properties of the systems which we are building. And I'm not gonna go too deep into the book right now for time reasons, but if you wanna know more about my thinking, Black Hat last year I gave a talk called The Fully Trained Jedi, it's available on YouTube. So, I really believe that we're at an inflection point. The combination of disclosure and liability creates a shift on the order of the Gates Trustworthy Computing Memo. It is going to be 
one of the biggest shifts in our careers, it may not have as specific a thing you can point to and say it was this thing on this day that shook, but it's certainly going to be enormous. And I, I wanted to share these ideas with you because I think that we have an opportunity to influence where this inflection point takes us. And so as we listen to the talks through the remainder of today, through the, you know, as we go forward, be thinking about what our professional judgment ought to be. And so, I think you all know I'm a fan of 80s science fiction movies, and so I want to close with a quote from one. So as Sarah Connor said, the future is not set. There is no fate but what we make. So I encourage you to make the right future. With that, thank you very much. I have a couple of minutes for questions. Yes. So it's a great question, is why are we seeing so much foot dragging with documentation in software versus medicine or aviation? And, and I think that my fundamental answer is this belief that you ain't gonna need it, right? Documentation work takes time. And if that time doesn't have payoff, then why don't you do something useful? <laughs> Right, and I'm so not better shoot that like why have a parachute for the plane I, I I agree with you. I'm I'm I, look, I'm I'm not saying no. I'm, you you ask why, and I think that's the answer, is people don't see it the way you and I do. And also the great thing is that the FDA requires a documentation. We don't have that so, no FDA Yes, so so your point is regulators are demanding it in medicine and other things and we don't have that in IT. So yes, that that is a so there, there's a belief that documentation isn't useful because it's always out of date. may also create liability and so it will be addressed. Yes. When you talk to doctors, they say the standard of care is what you go to in order to reduce liability. Mm -hmm. But my fiance is a doctor and she always comes to me and says the standard of care is far too low. How do you introduce liability in the security industry without creating a standard of care that sets minimum bar? So that is a great question, and I want to invert the thinking, which is without a standard of care, the standard is even lower. Okay. Um, and so yes, the, the, the gradation between what is minimally required and what great practice is, is something that will be there. My concern is that the people who are doing nothing today Yes. You didn't tell me that people were worried that this would increase liability, but if you've got ISO or software accreditation, you are already documenting it. You don't have any additional liability. And in law, there's a concept of novel. If it was a zero day, 
So let me split what you say in half. I totally agree with the first half. That if, if you are testing and documenting to your customers for soccer ISO that you're doing certain things and you're not doing them, there's a liability. I'm not sure if I agree that zero days are sufficiently novel to protect people because let's say the zero day is someone is passing user input to a stir copy. Maybe you should have known that. And so I think that what the standard of care, to your point, is, is something that we have to think about and get explicit so that we're not playing the game of gotcha. So your question about how do you tell them that these things are going to happen? So we can be prepared, not so I can tell them, hey, So I think the thing that I see when I talk to executives is not that they don't believe these things can happen. It's that they don't believe that there's effective ways to deal with them. And so it feels like a little bit of a black hole to them to say, we're going to chase this alien that's undefined. And I think one thing that often happens is I could chase that thing or I could get a feature that some customer is telling me will get my sale. And so setting standards of due care, saying you are responsible to do at least this much, gives you a backstop. But the other piece I really feel is we have to get specific about how do I get to the point where we do something and we can then feel good about what we've done, right? If this, how do I transform it from a forever problem to something that I can say, I'm gonna put this much energy into each rev and we know we're doing better than we did if we didn't put that energy in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, like That's a good one. Do I think the proliferation of large language models will act as a catalyst? Potentially. Um, we're already seeing libel suits. We're seeing a, I hate to say it, but quite entertaining instance of a lawyer who used ChatGPT to write his job. Right? And I, I, I hate to engage in that shot and Freud of saying, ha ha, look at, look at him. But, Lawyers have a professional responsibility, I think it's rule 11, that when they submit something to the court, they believe it to be true, and they have a reasonable basis for that. And this guy signed off on cases. The other side challenged him and said these cases don't exist. He went back and asked ChatGPT, rather than going to a law library, ChatGPT said, yes, I'm sure these cases exist. Why would you even ask such a thing? And he's in trouble because that doesn't meet the standards of care. And so I think that the knock on of that may be more people questioning why are we just trusting software? Why are we letting people get away from that, get away with this, excuse me? And that may roll into these broader questions of liability, but I think those were happening before LLMs, but it's a great point. I think LLMs may accelerate. Dana, how am I on time? We, we gotta go. We gotta go. Um, all right. But you will be available at the first coffee break to sign books out in the hall here. And of course, you can continue the conversation with them via Zoom or up there. Yes, and I'll be around all day. Thank you all very much. And <laughs>